back in May, Summer and I and David and Jill Jacobs who were here this morning with us and are like uh, family to us, we attended the wedding of Chris Boynton and Mary Kate Ferguson in Greenville, Georgia. As we often say, everyone has a story and you never really know someone until you know their story. But once you know their story, then perceptions change and hopefully actions change and hopefully we become kinder and gentler and more loving toward someone whenever you know what they've been through and their story. Let me tell you Mary Kate's. Her family moved to Calhoun, Georgia where we lived when she was a little girl. Her dad was transferred there by Mohawk, Mohawk Carpets. We've been talking a lot lately about engaging people in a spiritual conversation. Her next door neighbor, David Galloway, invited them to services. It's a simple thing, isn't it? We ought to do it more. And you can only imagine if we did what God might do with that invitation. They came that morning, and I happened to be preaching on Jesus. Specifically the story in John 1 where Andrew had been mesmerized by following Jesus. And he'd been convicted and excited about his teaching. And do you remember what he did? He ran and found his brother. And he said, we have found the Messiah. Come and see. And Peter's life was changed forever. And the impact of it still reverberates down to us today. When... Lee and Jackie and their two children left that day. I, I asked them, introduced myself, asked them if they had any questions. If so, I'd love to get with them and, and, and talk about them. They said they had plenty. So they invited me to their house on Tuesday night and the next Tuesday night and the next Tuesday night and the next Tuesday night. And I spent each Tuesday night for six months in their home. After they were baptized, Summer and I spent uh, the next six months, every Sunday night after services, in their home. And I want to say two things about that. If you spend once a week, every night, once a week, once a week, I can't even get it out here, once a week for a year in somebody's home, you're going to be blessed and they're going to get in your hearts. And that's what happened. Secondly, Lee asked me if I would share this good news with his mother, who lived in North Carolina. When she moved down, I did, and we were able to, we were baptized, uh, Francine, and grateful. And when Mary Kate became a teenager, we baptized her and her brother Austin as well. At our wedding, and I think we have a picture of her wedding. Can you put it up there now? At her wedding, her brother Austin introduced Summer and Jill to people there and said, "This was these are my mother's were my mother's two best friends." And were is past tense because in October of 2012, Jackie died suddenly. Some of you know what that's like. And then it wasn't long afterwards until her fiance died of bone cancer. And Mary Kate had to trust God no matter what. And no matter what, she decided to trust God, even though she knew there were going to be numerous difficult and dark days ahead. She was determined, however, to trust God and to let the joy of the Lord be her strength and she was determined that if she ever lost her song, that she would, through the Lord's help, regain it. Last year, she met Chris. She called us and wanted us to come meet him, which we did. On Christmas Eve last year, she called us. And uh, with the excitement in her voice and almost jumping out of the phone, she told us that uh, he proposed. And this is how he did it. And they were going to get married 
and we met with them early on Christmas morning before we uh, assembled to worship. We were thrilled for both of them. When they called several months ago to talk uh, about how they envisioned their ceremony going, they told me a couple of things. They said, we want you to come to Georgia and do your thing. We want you in the ceremony to glorify God. And because there's going to be a lot of people there who really don't know Jesus, we want you to point the way to Jesus. And we want you to talk about the love that Jesus has for us and how he demonstrated it and proved the love that he had for his glorious bride, the church. But it's what they said next that uh, got my wheels turning. They said, we've chosen as our theme verse Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19. And we want you to weave into the ceremony the principles in the story of Habakkuk. And I want to say two things about that. One, I could give you the cliff note versions of the story of Habakkuk. But I couldn't uh, quote Habakkuk off the top of my head at that phone call. I couldn't quote Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19 through nothing. So I got my Bible. I was reading it while they were on the phone. And then I decided that uh, if I was going to really make the principles in this book come alive and claim them, then I had to get it in order to share it. And I asked them about their vows, and they said they wanted to write their own, which is what Dylan and Cheyenne did recently. And anytime people do that and they're insightful, you have uh, an opportunity to get into their heart and their minds. And it's thrilling. And they actually do a lot better job than I could ever do in, say, reciting this. So I want to share with you first what each one of them, a portion of what each one of them said to each other, and use it as a springboard to our lesson this morning. And secondly, before I read what each of them committed and said to each other, I'd like for you to think about what you might say if you were given the assignment to write your own vows and say them to the one whom you loved. Mary Kate said, Christopher, I take you to be my husband. I promise to seek the Lord first and recognize him as my sustainer and the source of my joy so that I may enjoy the gift that you have given me in you. Nothing excites me more than thinking about how God's going to use you and being involved in that. And knowing that marriage is to be lived for God, I promise to step out in faith whenever and however we're led to do God's work. I will stand by your side through it all. I promise to rejoice with you in times of rejoicing and shoulder the pain with you when the hard stuff comes and wants to take you out. And when hurt comes in, instead of retreating and letting silence become a wedge between us, I promise to put in the hard work to work through it, whatever it is. I promise to spend my life learning you. Isn't that a great line? And I promise to leverage all I have to point you to Jesus. And I've got one word to say about that. Wow. And knowing what she's been through, I'll say it again. Wow. Chris then looked at Mary Kate and he said this, a portion of which is on the screen. Mary Kate, your radiant joy, your pure joy. I promise to make our marriage about displaying the glory of God. I promise to make every effort to stir up your affections for Jesus. I promise to make every effort to pray with you every morning in every season throughout each year. I promise to live on mission with you. We will serve those in need, love those who are hurting, celebrate those that are celebrating and mourn together with those that mourn. I promise to seek forgiveness and display forgiveness. And I will choose to believe the best in you. 
I promise to grieve with you. I promise to worship with you. And here is the line from Habakkuk 3, 17. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vine, we will rejoice in the Lord. We'll take joy in the God of our salvation. Again, I say, wow. To help us better understand what Habakkuk committed to and what Chris and Mary Kate did, I want to ask you to open your Bibles with me to this short three-chapter book that's fifth from the end of the Old Testament. The only thing we know about this man is here in this book that bears his name. His name is not mentioned in any other book of the Bible, so we don't know anything about his life. We don't know anything about his family. We don't know anything about his relationships, how he does life or relationships. We don't know anything about how he went about ministry. We know he was a prophet. He was a prophet who lived some 2,600 years ago in Judah. And unlike Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, whose prophecies and sermons are recorded in the books that bear their names, in Habakkuk's book, there is no prophecy that he preached, or no sermon that he gave that's recorded in this book. No, reading through this book is more like reading through his personal journal, which gives us a glimpse into the problems he was facing, the concerns he had on his heart, the burdens he was carrying, the emotions that he had. And I want to ask you, how many of you would be open to having someone read through your diary or your journal. One of the most humbling things that's ever been done for me was when one of my elders, a mentor, a dear friend, Brother Don Shackelford, came over to our house one evening when we lived in Searcy, Arkansas. And in his hands he had a book of several books of journals. And he said, I want you to read through them. They may help you. They were the years that he journaled about taking care of his father who had Parkinson's. And he said, I want you to read through them. And I want to ask you today, if you've ever kept a diary or journaled, would you give it to somebody and let them read your innermost thoughts? And if you would, you've got to trust that person to the hill, don't you? You've got to love them deeply to let them know your joys, your sorrows, your anxieties, your prayer requests, on and on it goes. That's what we get to do here when we read through this three chapter book. It only takes a few minutes to do it. It's simply the recording of a conversation that Habakkuk has with his God and God has with him. There is a part on the front part of your bulletin where you can uh, fill out uh, different things along with this lesson. Uh, I'll say it again, Habakkuk was an overwhelmed and struggling prophet. And maybe you've been in his shoes. Weary, worried, overwhelmed, discouraged. You don't understand why this has been the hand you're dealt or why this is the struggle you're having. You don't understand why there's evil going on all in the world around us and even evil among God's people. Sin was rampant in his land. But it's not just in the land. Sin was rampant among God's people. And let me just say this, it is today as well. If you don't think it is, let me just list a few. Pride. Greed. 
covetousness, lust, immorality, the works of the flesh mentioned in Galatians 5. And on and on we could go. Habakkuk was concerned about his country. He was concerned about God's people. He was concerned about his own personal problems. And he didn't know how long he could keep going. And he didn't understand why God would keep allowing these things to happen to him. Robert J. Morgan said, Habakkuk was a minor problem, minor prophet with a major problem. And this small book teaches us how to process problems and arrive at praise. And I want to share it with you this morning. Before we do, would you bow with me, please? Dear Father, there are numerous days and many times in our lives when we find ourselves in this prophet's shoes, overwhelmed, anxious, weary, struggling, not understanding why things have happened, not seeing how you could be at work, much less seeing people through your eyes. Regardless of the problems that we encounter, help us to process our problems and work through them and help us to turn them into praise like Habakkuk did. It's in the name of your son, the bridegroom himself, that we pray. Amen. Habakkuk's complaint when this book opens, and that's the bold heading in my Bible. Remember that he's talking to God. His complaint is, how long, Lord? And maybe you've been there. How much longer is this going to go on? I don't know how much longer I can hang in there. I don't know how much longer I can take it or put up with this, Lord. How much longer are you going to let me pray and not give me an answer to my prayers? Summer and I have prayed for a specific situation for eight years. In true confessions here, it uh, wasn't that long ago that I basically uh, quit praying it. Quit praying for this. And... Uh, you can rejoice with us that out of the blue, whatever that means, we got a positive answer this past week. But have you ever been there where you just asked how long? You prayed and prayed and prayed and you just don't see that answer. That's his first question to God, how long? How long? Now the next bold face phrase in my Bible says the Lord's answer. Look. Verse 5, at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed for I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe. Even if you were told what I'm going to do, you wouldn't believe it. In the past, many times when I've heard preachers preach this verse, my remembrance of that is that they would try to put a spin on this verse, a positive spin. And it would go something like, their explanation would go something like this. Look, things are bad now, but God's about to do something so wonderful that you wouldn't believe it. And please listen carefully. I believe that God is going to do something wonderful, so wonderful we won't believe it one day. But I don't believe that's the context of this verse. Instead of putting a positive spin on things, the Lord told him the truth. What's the truth? You think that things are bad now. Let me tell you something. It's going to get worse before it gets better. And how would you like to hear that? The Lord says they're savage predators who are going to come. They're going to come into your land. They're the big bad Barbaric Babylonians, the Chaldeans, one translation says. They're savage predators who are out for themselves, verse 8 says. They scoff at kings, verse 10 says. You can think in our terms today, this is ISIS. And they're coming here. They're coming here to our land. One day, God says to back in verse 11, they're going to sweep through Jerusalem. They're going to blow through this city like the wind. And it is not going to be pretty. In fact, it will be knee-buckling. I want to quit, 
quickly say two things about that. Those of us who have humbly accepted the challenge to speak for God must be truth tellers. And you know me well enough to know that I am wired to be encouraging. But 2 Timothy 4 says there's a threefold charge there for those who preach the word. And that's what? To reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. There's a time for correction. There's a time for reproof. There is a time for encouragement. But in this case, God speaks the truth. The second thing I want to say is this. All of us need a truth teller in our lives. Somebody who sees who realistically sees reality and sees how we are and will speak the truth to us, not what will just tickle our ears, not just what we want to hear. God is a God who cannot lie, so when he talks to Habakkuk, what does he say? I want to tell you the truth. The truth is not going to be easy for you to hear. The truth is going to be tough. It's going to get bad. The Babylonians are going to sweep in here. In fact, you know the story, what happens? God will take them away into a foreign land, won't he? But God's also going to be faithful to his people, isn't he? And ultimately, God's going to work good in that in even using the bad guys for good. And so when God tells Habakkuk that, it really confuses him now. He can't understand how there's going to be any good in that. And he's asked how long. You seem to be silent in all of my prayers, God. It didn't even seem like you're at work here. And now this is what you tell me is going to happen? And so he asked the why question. And I'll ask, have you ever asked it? Why, God, are you letting this go on? Why are you, is this the hand I've dealt? Why this? Why that? Why? And when God responds, he says this. Write this down. Write this down in your journal. Habakkuk, write this down. Bad things happen in life. They happen in this fallen world. But they do not stop my divine plans. That's what he's saying. So Habakkuk, what do you need to do? You need to trust me and you need to live by faith every single day. If you haven't marked Habakkuk 2 and verse 4 in your Bibles, let me encourage you to circle it right now. Circle it, mark it, highlight it on your phones. What does it say, the last phrase of it? The just shall live by faith. Those who want to please God and do what's right will claim his faithfulness and live by faith. It's one of the greatest verses in the Bible. It's reiterated three times in the New Testament. In Romans 1 verse 17, Galatians 3 verse 11, and Hebrews 10 38. You can mark it down. You can anchor your life and your day into it. There'll come a time in all of our lives when all we've got to do, and no, let me put it this way. There'll come a time in all of our lives when the only thing we can do is simply hold on to God and hold on to His faithfulness and hold on to His promises until, as the old hymn said, the storm passes by. I might not can ever figure everything out I might not can untangle all the messes I've gotten myself in. I might not have all of the answers to all of the why questions that I've asked. I might not can figure everything out. I can't make people do what's right. But what can I commit to? I can commit to trusting God Every single day, no matter what, and no matter what, I'll trust God. We say it often at Cross Point together, don't we? I'll trust God no matter what, and no matter what, I'll trust God. If you're inclined to do so, and we'll recommit to that this morning, 
Would you say it with me, please? I'll trust God no matter what. And no matter what, I'll trust God. That's what the Lord is asking Habakkuk to do. Just trust him. Every day, renew that trust and keep living by faith. The Lord then calls him to remember, as verse 14 says, that God's original plan is for the earth to be filled with his glory. But until it is, what should his and our attitude and mindset be? It's the last verse of chapter 2. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. What's the Lord saying? He's saying this, Habakkuk, don't panic. Keep calm. Yes, your problems are real. Yes, they're heavy. And yes, it's going to get worse. But the Babylonians one day will be judged just like everyone else. Until then, I'm still on my throne and in my holy temple. So don't panic. Stay calm. Be still. And keep bowing down before me. It's a one sentence hymn. And I want to ask you to pause and sing it together with us right now. conversation with the Lord and here's what the Lord has just told him Habakkuk now has a change in perspective he's now processed his problems through the lens of the Word of God and he takes God at his word and he recommits to living by faith and so he prays a prayer of praise which is recorded in chapter 3 and if you'll look at the inscription that's under it or at the end of it, either one, this prayer is meant to be sung and claimed. So what does he say? Verse 2, Lord, I stand in awe of you. I stand in awe of your faithfulness. I stand in awe of what you can do. I stand in awe of what you are going to do. Whether I see it or not, whether I understand it or not, I stand in awe of of you. Would you join us as we sing that very thought? You are beautiful beyond description to my Thank you. 
That brings us to the verse that Chris and Mary Kate chose for their wedding. And it brings us to the verse that Chris quoted in his vows. The verse that one writer called the most photographic depiction of faith and loyalty within the covers of the Old Testament. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vine. Can you picture him saying this now to Mary Kate? Or Habakkuk saying it to God? Though the olive crop fails, and there are no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stalls, what's he saying? Regardless of what happens, right? Whether we've got nothing, it's all taken away, whatever. Regardless of all the hardships that are coming our way, yet I'll rejoice in the Lord and I'll be joyful in God my Savior. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. They're saying to each other, and Habakkuk saying to God, I'm not just going to commit today to living by faith. No, I'm going to commit to remaining joyful and not letting Satan rob me of my joy in spite of all of this that I'm going through. And there is a difference, isn't it? They're saying, Lord, you're on your throne. I know you are. And yes, I know that we're going to have hard times. But from a big picture perspective, we're committed to trusting in you no matter what. And we're going to continue to walk hand in hand with you and with each other. And we're going to remain joyful. And there's a big difference between that and saying I'm happy today. We're going to remain joyful in the Lord. And we're going to let the joy of the Lord be our strength. So I want to ask you, as we almost end this lesson, to sing with us those two verses of that song and play, pay close attention to what we're committing to right now. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. I will not falter, I will not faint. He is my shepherd, I am not afraid. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of So we'll close with this. How can we work through our problems like Habakkuk did and like this young couple did and arrive at praise? God said to him, write this down. Write it down, not only in your journal, but emblazon it on your heart, says Deuteronomy 6 said. Write down what? The just live by faith. One day the earth will be filled with the glory of the knowledge of God. That'll be in the new heaven and new earth, and won't it be wonderful then? In the meantime, the Lord's in his holy temple. And no matter what, we're going to trust him. And we're going to rejoice in our Savior. And speaking of our Savior, Paul said, Colossians 1, he's the one we proclaim. Admonishing everyone and warning each other. He's the one we proclaim. Peter said he's the chief cornerstone. And he's the reason why. James says we can rejoice. We can praise God through the storm. We can praise God in the storm. We can praise God when the sun is shining down on us and the world's all as it should be. And we can praise God when the darkness seems to be engulfing us. Why? Either way, the Lord is still the Lord. And He's the Lord. He's the sovereign Lord of all. The one who's granted salvation to each and every one of us. We're going to sing the newer version of a song that we sang earlier today and that uh, 
On Christ the solid rock I stand, my hopes in Him, and all other grounds sink in sand. And we're going to sing this newer version about Him being the cornerstone as a song of encouragement this morning. And if you need Him, need the Lord to be your strength and your song, your rock and your redeemer and your savior, then we encourage you to come as three did in the first service this morning as together we stand and sing. <laughs>